There's little doubt that accountants have a useful role to play in the public sector. Like their counterparts in industry and in public accounting, accountants are often called upon to fill a variety of roles in the public sector, from leadership, advisory and elected positions, to career opportunities in auditing, financial reporting, and management accounting. There's no doubt that the public sector needs the assistance of accountants as well as those who have skills in accounting and auditing. Viewers may recall that Joseph Diaguardi interrupted his career as a partner at what was then known as a Big Eight auditing firm in order to campaign for and serve in the U.S. Congress. He explains why the public service in general, and the U.S. federal government in particular, could use the assistance of seasoned accountants and auditors. The point is that we have to understand the problem of the federal government. The problem of the federal government is that it is not employing tried and true principles developed by the accounting profession for maybe a hundred years or less since it's been operative and it needed these kinds of statements. And the fact is, and this is really where the double standard is, the right accounting system is used by the Securities and Exchange Commission. You cannot get an audit of a publicly traded company passed unless you have outside auditors and you have a clean opinion. But they refused to do that for the federal government. So what they're saying is, we need to protect shareholders. We need to protect investors. But why aren't they protecting taxpayers and citizens? I say this in most of my speeches and things like that. It's common sense. Well, I think citizens, especially those that have the accounting background, have to be more involved in what's going on. And how do you do that? Well, you know, you can write letters to the editors of, of the Wall Street Journal. If you're a partner in a major accounting firm, I remember we had several in my firm that did that. The point is, we got to look at how we restructure the people who have to deal with financial management, accounting, um, fiscal responsibility, all, all the major elements of what makes a sound entity as a financial entity. Viewers may recall that the head of the Government Accountability Office is known as the Comptroller General of the United States. And two former Comptroller Generals, Charles Boucher and David Walker, have two things in common. Like Joe Diaguardi, they each interrupted their careers in public accounting to bring their talents into the government. And like Joe Diaguardi, they each appeared as expert commentators on our programs. I spent 22 years in the accounting profession at that point, I think it was the world's largest accounting firm, Arthur Anderson, much before the Enron problem. And we had a group of partners that were concerned about the public sector. I was one of them. And one of our major assignments was the Treasury Department telling us to work with Lazard Frears on the bailout of New York City. Because what we did in New York City is to prepare conventional financial statements because they were not on the accrual basis. And worse than that, they were on what you would call municipal accounting funds. So you, there were many pieces that you had to get together to understand what is this financial entity called New York City? I use the word financial entity, it was more than that. But in terms of looking at whether or not it's serving its purpose as a financial entity, we had to put it together. And we did that successfully. And it was the head of Arthur Anderson, Harvey Kaepernick, a visionary, who said, you know, you guys did such a good job, and we got paid very well from the Treasury Department to do it, and I'm going to authorize your team to stay together to do the same thing for the United States of America, and it's going to be our contribution to this great country. So we did huddle. It took about a year, and you can imagine piecing together all the pieces of the United States of America, including government-sponsored enterprises, many of them not on the books, and then other things that, you know, people didn't understand whether they were really part of the federal government or something else. We had to do that. And we presented the first consolidated financial statements of the United States of America. It's well known that the demographics of the U.S. Senate and House of Representatives don't proportionally reflect the American population. 
For example, attorneys make up exactly 40 percent of the recently elected Congress, while according to the American Bar Association, lawyers make up only 0.4 percent of the U.S. population. In fact, a key part of the job for members of Congress is the power of the purse, overseeing the collection of $3.3 trillion in taxes and the expenditure of $4 trillion in revenue. Out of all 535 voting members of the House and the Senate, there are currently 12 professional pilots and 30 licensed medical professionals. But sadly, only 11 out of our elected representatives have received professional training as accountants. So accountants would say, why should I leave a job paying me let's say a partner in a public accounting firm, maybe half a million dollars a year. That's not what I got paid, but it was pretty good even back in 1984. Why should I do that? And that's the key question. How are we going to motivate accountants to look at public service at some point in their life? And these things have to change if we're going to have the right people in there. Why don't accountants run? Because they'd have to go through a gauntlet of disclosure. I mean, I thought it was bad. It's, it's worse than you think. You, everything that you do, everything that you own is, is there. And if, God forbid, you're hiding something, someone will report it. We see it every day in the press today. I haven't forgotten what elected me back in 1984. In 84, it was this. I was a respected accountant. People liked accountants. If you ranked anybody in 84 by industry or by job, you would see accountants either the top or the second. I understand today they're not that far up, but at the bottom is Congress, used car dealers, and pedophile priests. So, I mean, you can imagine, <laughs> I'm just making the point that you have to go, you know, accountants still are esteemed. So people should say, why shouldn't I do it? Dioguardi did it. Although Joe Dioguardi was unsuccessful in his bids for re-election to Congress, it is worth noting that Tom Suozzi was elected to the House of Representatives from a different congressional district in New York than the one Dioguardi represented. Not only is Representative Suozzi a CPA, but like Dioguardi, he formerly worked as an auditor for the firm of Arthur Anderson and Company. On a more timely level, Suozzi is a member of the House Ways and Means Committee, which writes many of the country's tax laws, and is the congressional committee requesting copies of President Trump's tax returns. And by the way, I had the help of a great firm because they started something called early retirement for public service. Chuck Bowser was the first one to get it. And I couldn't qualify for that the way it was written because I wasn't 50. I couldn't get a pension. I still don't have a pension from Arthur Anderson or from Congress because I didn't spend five years there. I'm not complaining. I'm a happy guy. I don't owe anything to anybody, and I want to do the right thing. So the point is we need to somehow find a way to energize accountants around America, whether they be CPAs or others. Why? Because they are informed citizens. Why aren't more of these big accounting firms doing what Arthur Anderson did and taking some of their better partners that are saying at that mid, you know, that thing that happens to everybody, they call it a, a mid-age crisis, and somewhere between 45 and 55? And why not say to them, you know what? You did so well with us, and we'd love to keep you here. But if you think, because we've analyzed your, your, your file, you've got a great personality, you get along with people, uh, you're smart, and maybe you should be running for Congress so that we have another CPA in there representing our values. So number one, we got to promote this. And the accounting firms could do it. Many of the qualities that they would bring are the qualities that made them successful in the public accounting profession, especially if they're partners, because they had to engage with a, a lot of different people. Uh, they were always making proposals. They were always looking to, to do what's right, obviously, and to gain the trust of others, uh, many of them to gain the respect of their peers. The good news is that it's frequently congressional staff members, rather than their elected bosses, who deal with the nuts and bolts of public policy. The bad news is that most of the so-called legislative assistants are lacking in any specialized financial training. Everybody's into money, especially the federal government and the people that are lobbyists and anybody who's got jobs with the federal government. They first see their problem as, what is it going to do for me? What is it going to do for America? What's it going to do for the next generation? So these are things that CPAs and accountants should, be, should, should understand easily. So it's not a quantum leap 
As I said, it's not rocket science. We're not telling them to become you know, experts in physics or chemistry. It's basic accounting. And we're not doing it in the federal government. Of course, in the public sector, there's always some crisis that's right around the corner, from a looming government shutdown to a potential scandal that's brewing. But in reality, there really is an approaching disaster. A recent Government Accountability Office study predicts that accounting and auditing have become critical skills gap issues for the public sector, particularly as government agencies are facing the impending retirements of existing financial staff members. If you look at the makeup of the accounting profession, it's not just the CPAs and these now big four and all these other medium-sized and smaller accounting firms. You have um, not only the 50 state societies of CPAs. So when you add up all of these accountants, you have to be talking about a couple of million people. Now, why are they important? They're important because they're citizens of the United States of America. And if you're not a concerned citizen, and as a concerned CPA citizen that I am today after leaving Congress, I'm active trying to change things for the better. And I say to myself, after all these years, I'm a general without an army. Why aren't I getting, why am I not getting the support of the accounting profession? But a, a CPA has an element that others don't have, a precise knowledge of accountability, of, 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 of things like fiscal responsibility, of computers, you name it. This is not rocket science accounting. Why aren't you hiring the people who are professionals who are able to get in there and figure out what's going on? How do we get the average citizen who has no idea that they ever want to run for anything, but to understand that their tax dollars are not being used properly, that they're not getting a dollar's worth of goods and services from the federal government for a dollar's worth of taxes. Because we don't really know the cost of government. It's disguised. In a manufacturing plant, and I took cost accounting to become a CPA, you know, you have to apply even overhead and labor costs and everything. We're not doing that. So we really don't know even one entity within the government whether it's functioning. As you would expect, the government has a responsibility to use timely, reliable, and comprehensive financial information when making decisions which have an impact on citizens' lives and livelihood. Despite good intentions and past efforts by crusaders like Joe Diogordi, in many ways the job is still unfinished. In many ways, the enactment of the Chief Financial Officers Act of 1990 marked the beginning of what was hoped to be a new era, not only in federal management and accountability, but also in efforts to gain financial control of government operations. To meet the demand for improved accountability and transparency from the financial management practices of federal agencies, the CFO Act required that, one, 23 federal agencies would create chief financial officer positions who was both to have extensive financial management experience and to be a presidential appointee. And two, federal agencies were to put together financial statements for auditing, which would then be carried out by the Controller General or by the Inspector General. On the one hand, the CFO Act, as introduced in Congress by then-Representative Diaguardi, was enacted and signed into law by President Bush. But on the other hand, many of the promised reforms have not come to fruition. For instance, the federal government has not had a permanent chief financial officer, known as the OMB controller, for a little more than two years since David Mader left the position in January 2017. The first thing they should do is uh, go to their staff person that has access to things and pull the CFO Act. Pull the original version and pull the one that passed. If they're really interested in the disconnects that I'm telling you about, look at how they took the CFO Act which was at the right place at the right time. Because as I said before, the SNL crisis motivated many congressmen to look for something because they were being blamed for this and they needed this bailout. And the three things that were really operative to do what I thought had to be done, the Arthur Anderson way, was one, to have a CFO that was completely independent. And the model I used was the Controller General. Because the Controller General is a figure of Congress. But what happened was they took out the fact that the CFO should be independent. And what I had in there was a 15-year term, like the Controller General, not coterminous with any presidential election, to make him both independent in perception as well as fact. 
Who are CFOs? These are people who are not only good with numbers, but they use those numbers for strategic planning for their organizations, and, and they think ahead as to what the problems could be. And they're well trained. So I said, every CFO has to be professionally qualified, either an experienced management accountant or a CFO or a CPA or both. What do they do? They made it a political boondoggle. All the CFOs became political appointees. So these are friends of friends of somebody. But the deputy CFOs, those are the ones that they said had to be qualified. That's not right. Uh, going further, I said, why did they take out accrual accounting? That was in the bill. CFO Act. We need it. And I made the case why we needed it. It's not there. Still not there. According to a much-publicized, well-researched study of the CFO Act, 20 years after its enactment, many far-reaching benefits have been achieved, including increased transparency and strengthened internal control. Yet, the study concluded that, quote, work must continue in many areas to fully optimize the impact of the CFO function, end quote. So when you get the recent statement that was put out for the fiscal year ended September 30th, 2018, you will see that there is no liability on the financial statements, the balance sheet and, and, and whatnot, for Social Security, Medicaid, Medicare, Medicaid, and a trillion dollars worth of federal pensions for the military it has not been put on the books. And there's many other things. If you looked at these government-sponsored enterprises, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, you name it, there's probably 30. Some of them they don't refer to as government-sponsored enterprises, but they treat all these entities the same in that they're not on the accrual basis, and most of them are underwater. Now, you might say, well, why is it that we're not recording this liability? And worse than that, we have student loans, we have all kinds of government loans, and banks every year with these loans that they have on their books would then assess what is the condition of these loans? How many of them do we feel by experience and by our estimates are bad this year? It has to go on the P&L, profit and loss statement, as an expense. Government doesn't do that. As expected, the Department of Defense's first ever audit discovered its share of bad news. There were major flaws in how the Pentagon handles IT processes and major challenges with its internal tracking databases. But there was also a lot of good news. There were no discoveries of any major cases of fraud or abuse. The audit, long sought by Congress and good government groups, was recently unveiled, covering almost $3 trillion in DOD assets. Of course, calling the audit initiative a single audit isn't strictly correct, as the effort, led by the Department of Defense's Inspector General, in collaboration with the Comptroller's Office, was actually 21 different audits done by a collection of auditing teams. According to a fact sheet, the audit involved over 1,000 auditors from outside firms, as well as 150 auditors from the Inspector General's office who visited over 600 DOD locations, requested over 40,000 documents, and tested over 90,000 sample items. On the one hand is the good news. Centralized databases could now identify all of the major pieces of equipment that DOD owns. And to be fair, the department is getting much closer to full accountability. On the other hand, the bad news is that even though the Government Accountability Office has been required to audit the federal government's consolidated financial statements for more than two decades, that task will be impossible until the Department of Defense gets a clean audit. I've been complaining since 1994 about the fact that the act that I put in required every government department and agency to audit. And by the way, they didn't say independent audits. They said audit. They meant the Government Accountability Office, the General Accounting Office in the past. And when I talk about not having the audit, well, I talked every year. Finally, because of the problem that the defense, uh, DOD had, armed services, that they couldn't present a set of books, financial statements, to the Controller General that didn't have what he called material weaknesses. That's a very bad word. If you have material weaknesses, that's going to prevent uh, an independent, uh, any kind of an audit. And they're loaded with these material weaknesses. And we just saw the headline in the Washington Post that an audit cannot be 
yet given to the Defense Department, which means that you can't do an audit for the federal government because it's one of the biggest pieces of it, it's materiality. And here it is, we spent $400 million and the material weaknesses, the dislocation of things. So we need to get some of these very successful CPAs to understand that they have maybe a fiduciary role to play here because CPAs are people that are trusted and they do have the public interest at heart because it's their audits that are giving the imprimatur on the financial uh, ability of a corporation. The federal budget serves many important functions, including tracking the government's cash flows, serving as a key instrument in national policymaking, summarizing how fiscal policy changes over time, and communicating the nature and scope of governmental activities. The net costs of federal activities are estimated throughout the federal budget using two fundamentally different accounting measures, cash accounting and accrual accounting. The principal difference between cash and accrual accounting lies in the timing of when the commitment or collection of budgetary resources is recognized. Whether programs are accounted for on a cash or an accrual basis can, in some cases, as Joe Diaguardi points out, significantly affect the size and timing of their estimated deficit effects. For example, cash-based estimates used in the budgeting process generally reflect costs over the 10-year period on which the process focuses. However, that period may not be long enough to capture the full extent of some activity's effects. Now people will say to me, well, Joe, why aren't we lobbying for the accrual basis? Well, we had two Hoover commissions back in, 19, in the 1950s, one under President Truman, one under President Eisenhower. Both concluded that we need, and they used the word, the accrual basis of accounting to properly account for things. And they gave the Congress, I think it was five years, a number of years to, to get this thing implemented. It wasn't implemented. Johnson gets a, a, a force together and they conclude, you know what, we got to do this. It didn't happen then. Then it goes to Nixon, who agreed, we got to do this. And then Watergate comes up. It didn't happen then. And then they just let it go. So we have on the books right now the law that would enforce or would allow us to enforce a cruel basis, but it's not being enforced because Congress doesn't feel it's important. And why don't they feel it's important? Because many people in Congress, especially those appropriators, know that if we had to account for things the right way, and if we had to put on the books all of these liabilities for these commitments and promises and whatnot, then they would not be able to get the money they need to look good politically because they want to bring things back to their district or they want to just fund something that they feel is important because the government is loaded with liabilities. It has very few assets that you can reduce to money. You have heritage assets, try to sell the monuments or sell you know, government buildings. No money. You, you may have to put them on the balance sheet for something. That's fine. For more than two decades, there has been a new standard setter for federal government accounting the Federal Accounting Standards Advisory Board, or FASAB. Viewers may recall that in 1999, the AICPA Council approved a resolution designating FASAB as the group that promulgates U.S. GAAP for federal governmental entities. Nevertheless, some federal entities follow GAAP for non-governmental entities, as promulgated by the Private Sector Financial Accounting Standards Board. For example, Federal government corporations, the U.S. Postal Service, certain component entities of the Department of the Treasury, and some smaller entities have historically applied FASB GAAP and continue to do so. According to Joe Diaguardi, the split in authority over GAAP needs to be resolved. One of the most important things, and I gave this testimony before the Financial Accounting Standards Advisory Board, FASAB. And why do we need an FASAB? We had the FASB. But somehow they decided that the federal government was a, specific, was a special kind of entity, and we needed accounting principles to accommodate them. And I said to myself, this doesn't make sense. We should have the same principles that any large corporation has, and obviously the accrual basis of accounting. When I saw the first statement that came out from the federal government, uh, I looked for the liability of Social Security, because I remember we put that on the books of the federal government 
in that statement. It was about $5 trillion at that point, probably 1980. It wasn't there. So when I went before this group, I said to them, why is it that you found it appropriate to take this liability off the statement that Arthur Anderson felt was there, was good? You know what their response was? Well, the law says that if we run out of funds, the Social Security Trust Fund is, and the government is not obligated to pay on anything. And as it diminishes, they can reduce the percentage. But that's not what Arthur Anderson said. They knew that. They said, if you want to record a liability, legality is one part. Practice is another. The fact of expectations is another. These are the way accountants think about things. But obviously that wasn't employed then, and it's not employed now. Well, what do we spend our money on? That's what the political process should be about. And that's why you have 420, 35 members in the Congress, in the House, and 100 members in the Senate. Because it's their job to say, now, we have this ability to raise money. The United States debt ceiling, or debt limit, is a legislative limit on the amount of national debt that can be incurred by the U.S. Treasury, thus limiting how much money the federal government may borrow. The debt ceiling is an aggregate figure which applies to the gross debt, which includes debt in the hands of the public and in intra-government accounts. Much to the consternation of Joe DiGuardi and others, because federal expenditures are authorized by separate appropriations legislation, the federal debt ceiling does not directly limit government deficits. In effect, it can only restrain the Treasury from paying for expenditures and other financial obligations after the debt limit has been reached. Sure, we have assets, a few million bucks, but we got probably a trillion dollars worth of liabilities, including the statutory debt this year going to 22 trillion, which is what allows them to sell those bonds every year, plus another, at least from my last count, 50 to 70 trillion for Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, just those three. Now, where did they get the money? Obviously, you can't get money if you're the federal government it's common sense unless you sell bonds. And there's another reason why accountants should be understanding of this issue. Any year that goes by and you get a budget deficit, look at the number of treasury bills, bonds, notes that have to be sold a year later. In one year, I think it was three years ago, four years ago, the amount was, the deficit was $500 billion. We had to spend a, tr a, a trillion $200 billion. Why is there such a disconnect? It's a disconnect because they're not recording on the books the values of the promises, commitments, other things, and yet they have to be paid either the following year or the, or the years after. What's paid out the following year, that's the statutory debt limit. You need to, you need to now have the wherewithal to do it. It's got to be done by legislation. So accountants should be, wake up just for that. Why? If I add up the budget deficits, don't I get to the amount of the national debt of the United States of America? That difference is what is pretty much off the books. And that's why we need the accrual basis of accounting. And in 10 years, according to my numbers, we just got the, the, the ones, this year, the interest on the national debt is $325 billion. That's what we pay out. That's a mandatory expense. You don't pay it out, you're bankrupt, you lose your credit rating. Ten years from now, and these, this is independent numbers, this is the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office. This is not the Congressional Budget Committee. This is an independent group. In the tenth year, it's $935 billion. Now, if you extrapolate forward, within the next five years, it's going to a trillion dollars. Imagine putting a trillion dollars in the budget, and we don't have the money. In enacting the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, Congress needed to find revenue offsets to allow the desired reduction in tax rates. As a result, several of the well-publicized tax hikes were aimed at and are affecting not-for-profit organizations. Because Joe Diaguardi represented many nonprofit groups during his own public accounting career, he tells us to what extent so-called exempt organizations should be subject to a wide range of federal taxes. I decided because I was an expert in not only the accounting rules for Public, private sector, but nonprofit and public, I had this, this kind of trilogy that I would be valuable on the board of a nonprofit. 
So I joined the board of American Cancer Society, the Phoenix House was on that board. 30 years, by the way. You won't be surprised, but author, activist, and former congressman Joe Diaguardi had several messages for our viewers to take away from this segment. I think this could be a good beginning to emphasize the fact that CPAs are not just to making things add up and, and doing audits, but they have a responsibility for the public interest because of their knowledge, their esteem, the fact that they all go through codes of ethics and, and, and whatnot. So there is something that's already built in to being a CPA. The fact that they are expected to be fiduciaries, not just for the accounting profession, but for the, I think, the public. Because the public holds them in high esteem. And the way that's repaid is for you to see yourself then as someone the public trusts, and you got to repay that trust by being a true fiduciary so that you are doing something that protects them and protects the people that they're responsible for. That's the way I see a fiduciary. So the point is, can't we get people to understand that they were the beneficiary of great leaders in the past who made an attempt to do the right accounting and balance their books so that they wouldn't put a burden on the next generation, let alone a burden that's not even disclosed. So we have to make this case that this is not fair. You know, people, that's a great word for accountants, by the way, because when we say that the books are proper, we say that they present fairly, right? Well, everything in life should be fair. Yeah.